Thanks for coming along, everyone. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to take you through how uh, rocks are created and transformed and try and um, wrap up some of these fundamental concepts that Tegan and Chris have introduced. Since it formed about 4.6 billion years ago, all that time ago, the actual mass of the Earth, the weight of it, hasn't really changed that much. But as Chris and Tegan have showed, it's undergone huge changes. Supercontinents have been created, split apart, mountain belts have formed and been eroded. But meteorites only make up a really tiny fraction of the mass of the Earth. And all that magma, all that lava, all that rock that's undergone change had to have come from somewhere. So we come up with the rock cycle. It's a really stylized representation of how rocks are created, how they're consumed and recycled through the Earth by geological processes. It incorporates all the tectonic plates, everything that happens from the mantle into the crust and on the surface of the Earth. And the different stages of these rock, rock transformations are the basis for the different rock types you might have heard about. So the igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks and, and metamorphics. The type of rock that's produced really just depends on where in the rock cycle you start to look. Um, before I get too much into that though, I'm just going to step back a bit and actually define what we mean when we say a mineral and a rock. <coughs> so a mineral is a naturally occurring substance. It has a fixed chemical composition, so it's really always made of the same stuff. And all the individual atoms arrange themselves in a very rigid lattice-like structure. So there is between different minerals, but you can sort of imagine the atoms arranging themselves like this into a really rigid structure. When we talk about rocks, though, it's, an, it's a solid, naturally occurring substance as well, but it's an aggregate of one or more minerals. So, for example, granite, which we all know and love, is actually made up of several different minerals uh, together to form that granite. So coming back again to this rock cycle, the types of rocks are really classified by their origin, the geological processes that form them. Igneous rocks uh, come in two varieties. We have intrusive igneous rocks that form from molten rock deep in the Earth's crust, uh, slowly cooling and forming large crystals over time. And also extrusive igneous rocks, which happen when that uh, magma comes to the surface forming lava and it cools very rapidly, forming small crystals, sometimes too small to see. They can contain gas bubbles like this basalt here. Sedimentary rocks are formed from the deposition of sediment uh, in basins or um, on the surface of the earth or uh, in the ocean. Uh, the sediment grains are cemented together. They might be too fine to see, very fine grain, or they can be enormous class of actually other rocks or organisms. Um, they can form in, uh, often you'll see sediments having very fine layers or very thick layers. This is something you actually might recognise from State Circle up the road. Just under Parliament House, there's uh, lovely sediment that's exposed there. Uh, and also another really common um, sedimentary rock is limestone formed from um, uh, dead organisms. Metamorphic rocks are kind of in between sedimentary and igneous rocks. They're formed when um, solids are deformed under really immense heat and pressure, but we don't actually melt them. Um, if we take a sedimentary rock, a really common one called a shale, if you start uh, putting that under huge heat and pressure, it turns into a slate, uh, and that can then be further transformed via metamorphism into a schist. And we do have some great examples of those um, on the table afterwards if you want to come and have a look at that transformation happening. Um, another good example, so this is actually from Red Hill. It's um, a hornfells, it's some volcanics that have been uh, heated. Um, you can see the bands there. And lime, uh, sorry, metamorphosed limestone is marble. The rock types and minerals that we see around the earth, they're not random. Um, it may seem like that, but they're formed by really specific processes. And it's understanding that that tells us about the history of the earth. If we go back to this concept of cycling material through the earth and reusing it, I might, I'll step you through what it might look like if we just followed like a single crystal, single mineral grain. Zircon's a great example, and we use it here really well. Um, forms in granites um, as an intrusive igneous rock. And because it's so hard, it can really go through anything the Earth wants to throw at it, even over billions of years. But it undergoes tiny changes as it goes through the rock cycle, and we can measure that to um, either understand its history and, and its age as well. And that's what we do um, with the shrimp in the geochronology lab. 
So if we start with, say, the crystallisation of a granite, uh, tens of kilometres in the Earth over millions and millions of years, and we'll follow that zircon grain there. Yeah, it's there. Over millions of years, as it cools and forms a solid granite, it can be slowly uplifted, and the overlying rocks eroded. It comes out at the surface. This is actually from granites at, the, at Kangaroo Island. They're quite famous. Once it's exposed at the surface of the Earth, um, water, salt, ice, uh, wind, all of these sort of processes that um, we shield ourselves from start to eat away at rock. And you can see that uh, on houses, on gravestones. They're great weathering agents. So if we have our granite at the surface, it starts to get broken down into smaller and smaller particles, into boulders, and then into individual mineral grains by water is a great one. Um, and it might, that zircon grain might get thrown into a river and eventually transported out into the ocean. You can see our little zircon grains hanging off the beach there, and eventually it'll get deposited in the ocean. If it's a deep enough point in the ocean, it can have kilometres of sediment accumulating from all different sources. If we take it back here when we can see a bit more of the scale, like I said, if it's kilometres and kilometres of sediment accumulating, if that's sitting on top of a tectonic plate that's in a, near a subduction zone, that sediment will start getting dragged underneath with it. And over time, if it keeps going um, underneath the overriding plate, the heat and pressure gets so much that it's transformed into a metamorphic rock. And if that transformation continues, sorry, it'll eventually be melted and it can start that process all over again. As I said at the beginning, this is a really stylized representation. And in the natural world, unfortunately, it's rarely cyclic like this. It can go back on itself and every which direction. But this is just an illustration to start with. Um, to take it to something you might be a bit more familiar with, actually. The rocks on Black Mountain, or some part of uh, the, rocks, the sedimentary rocks that make up Black Mountain, probably started their life as an exposed igneous rock, which was eroded and deposited into the ocean forming a sediment, um, and over time it was uplifted and compacted. And now that it's exposed again, instead of being remelted and extruded, it's actually turning into a sediment again. I want to take you even smaller now, or at an even uh, finer scale, down to what we mean when, when we talk about minerals and why they're so important, why geologists get so excited. It's minerals that, and the rocks that they're in that really tell us about the history of the Earth. Um, that minerals give us some beautiful specimens and there are some excellent ones in the National Mineral Collection that we have part of in the foyer, but sometimes it's the ones that don't look so nice um, that really tell us some interesting stuff. I'm going to relate this to something I know a fair bit about, baking, and it's something that we all know and love. And minerals and rocks are a bit like a cake. You need the right ingredients, but you can't just pour the same ingredients and the same minerals into a, a KitchenAid and expect the same result every time. <laughs> so we have the list of ingredients, but then we also have the processes that they undergo, whether we mix them, whether we heat them, whether we put them in the fridge, whatever we do with them. In the natural world, this is our ingredients list. This is our pantry, the uh, periodic, periodic table of the elements. We have 98 naturally occurring elements on the earth. And quite a lot of these, um, in different varying combinations, go into form the thousands of different minerals that make up the planet. A really basic, really common one is quartz, silicon and oxygen, arranging themselves into a rigid lattice to form quartz, one of the most common minerals in the Earth's crust. But if we add a few extra elements, like some, maybe some magnesium and some iron, we can get olivine. Olivine is one of the main ingredients in an intrusive igneous rock called peridotite. We have an example of it here. Peridotite is the main constituent of the Earth's mantle, <coughs> forming hundreds, up to hundreds of kilometres beneath the Earth's surface. What's happened with um, this piece here, it's a peridotite bomb. And so as that piece of um, rocks formed deep in the Earth, it's actually been violently exploded to the Earth's surface in a volcano. The peridotite is this green part you can see here, but the lava that came around it through that volcano as it was shot up into the sky and cooled very rapidly has formed this teardrop shape that you see around it. 
So this is an intrusive rock, I guess, coated in, a, in an extrusive rock. Because it's, been, it, because it's come up so quickly and so violently and has been so well preserved, it's like a direct sample into what's going on deep beneath the Earth's surface, and it's far beyond the reach of any drill rig we have. It's understanding things like this at the tiny, tiny elemental scale, and then also at the bigger scale that gives us insights into the history of the Earth. And this is really what we do in Earth science here at GA and um, in the wider Earth science community as well. We take things from an analyses and understanding everything in context from a single grain and the atoms within that grain up to, say, a whole rock, and then put them in the context of the tectonic plates and the rest of the globe around them. Time to get out the, uh, the red and green cards again. So the Soviets drilled a borehole. It's called the Kola Super Deep Borehole. You might have heard of it. And at this stage, it's got the world record for the deepest borehole on the planet, just over 12 kilometres. If you're thinking at the scale of the Earth's core, how far did that borehole get? Do you reckon it went 0.19% through the Earth or 1.9%? Yeah, it's pretty good. There's a lot of red there, and yeah, it only got 0.19% um, through to the core at over 6,000 kilometres depth. And what kind of igneous rock is a basalt? Is it an intrusive or an extrusive rock? Good, you were listening. <laughs> yeah, it's an extrusive. I think that about wraps it up. Do we have any questions? <laughs>